Welcome to the City of Glendale 9th Annual Armenian Genocide Commemoration Event. Please welcome Event Committee Co-Chairpersons, Mayor Aran Ajarian and Council Member Frank Contell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Pari Yegerek. We're very proud to uh, have the ninth this is the ninth City of Glendale Genocide Commemorative Event here in the Alex Theater. I'm very proud to be co-hosting this event and co-chairing the event with my colleague, uh, Mr. Frank Quintero, former mayor, current councilman. We're hoping that you will enjoy this evening's event. We're trying to make it as educational, as emotional, and stirring as possible. One bit of housekeeping. You may have all been given, hopefully, a small electronic candle when you came into the theater. Uh, please do not remove the white tab on the bottom. We'll be telling you when the proper time to do that will be. That will be towards the end of the program. Let me go to Mr. Quintero. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you this evening on uh, one of the most solemn days of the Armenian calendar. There are a number of dignitaries that I'd like to uh, read their names that are with us tonight, starting with uh, the City of Glendale Council Member John Drayman, Council Member Laura Friedman, City Clerk Artie Kasakian, City Manager Jim Starbird, the Chief of Police Rhonda Pampa, the Chief of Police, uh, Chief of Fire Harold Scoggins, our City Attorney Scott Howard, and our Community Parks Director George Chapchian. Also in attendance is Congressman Adam Schiff, Senator Carol Liu, from the Governor's Office, Lisa Galustian, from the Consul General of Armenia, Grigor Hovanesian, Sheriff Lee Baca, Rita Hajimanukian, representing uh, Supervisor Mike Antonovich, and from the two Armenian churches, Serpasan Vache Josefian and Father Voskin Ajamian. From the Glendale Unified School Board, we have Nairi Narabedian and two former mayors, Larry Zarian and Rafi Manukian. And then uh, we also have two um, candidates for the State Assembly, Sander Romani and Mike Gatto, as well as a congressional candidate, John Colbert. At this time, I'd like to invite to the podium uh, our very own Congressman Adam Schiff, who works tirelessly for the Armenian causes on Capitol Hill. Thank you. It's an honor to join you this evening. And I want to thank all of you who over the last uh, many years have helped to educate me about the Armenian Genocide. I feel, compared to many of my colleagues in the Congress, that I have an advantage that they don't have. I've had the opportunity to sit with you in your living rooms, I've had the opportunity to hear your stories, I have the opportunity to hear about the parents you barely knew, or the grandparents you never knew, the cousins who were lost. I've talked to survivors who were put on forced marches through the desert, who lost track of their siblings along the way, who saw their spouses disappear or their parents perish on the doorsteps of churches. These are the stories that you've shared with me. For me, the 1.5 million, which for many of my colleagues is just a number, is instead aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and family. When my colleagues ask me, why do we resurrect the past? Why bring up something 95 years ago? Why risk alienating an ally? I say to them, I think there are really two imperatives. And the first is a moral imperative. 
We may not be able to put ourselves in the shoes of those who perished in the desert, but we can imagine the questions they would have asked. How could this be happening to us? How could the world allow this to go on? Does the world even know what is happening to us? And who will there be to speak up and bear our witness? And I think it is imperative for the greatest nation on earth to be the witness of those people who died in the desert. I think it is imperative if we want to exercise a position of moral leadership that we answer those voices from the desert who ask who will be witness for us by saying resoundingly, we will, we will. Elie Wiesel has written that the denial of genocide is the final chapter of genocide, and we dare not become complicit in that final chapter of genocide. In addition to this moral imperative, there is a very practical imperative as well, and that is this. How can we lead on issues like Darfur? How can we speak out with the moral authority that we need to take action in places like Darfur if we play politics with genocide? if we are unwilling to speak out categorically against each and every genocide, wherever and whenever it occurs, whether it offends an ally or not, unless we stop playing politics with genocide, unless we speak plainly truth to power, we cannot have the moral force we need to deal with contemporary genocides like Darfur. So we have a moral imperative. We have a very practical imperative. And I want to thank you for your advocacy for your memories, for bearing witness, and we will fight on until we succeed. Thank you and God bless. I would like to invite our Consul General from Armenia, Gregor Hovanesian. Thank you, Mr. Quintero. Uh, dear friends, council members, Mr. Mayor, elected officials, compatriots, we're marking the 95th anniversary of the Armenian genocide against the background of quite dramatic developments over the last year. As residents of, of the city, of Glendale, that, that's home to uh, one of the largest Armenian communities in the United States. He witnessed dramatic developments as Armenia was engaging its, 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 its neighbor, Turkey, into a normalization process. We saw demonstrations, resentment, hunger strike. Today, I have a feeling that we came out of that dramatic period reinvigorated, united, stronger, more full of optimism. As our country, our president, our government reaffirmed that recognition, international recognition and condemnation of genocide, one of the most atrocious crime in the history of mankind, is a top priority for our country. And the international engagement, more active Armenia's engagement in international and regional issues cannot and will not happen at the cost of, 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 of this campaign. So tonight, as a representative of that government and as a resident of Glendale, you know that we, uh, it's been uh, almost a year that we re relocated from uh, Beverly Hills to, to Glendale and we're your subjects now, uh, so to say. Uh, I, I, I wish to extend my, uh, my gratitude, personal and on behalf of my government, for, for, for this wonderful gesture of solidarity with, uh, with our people and, and, uh, and the Republic of Armenia. A uh, couple of hours ago, we, we solemnly uh, lowered, we, we brought our national flag to uh, half mast. It's going to stay like that on Glenox Avenue until tomorrow evening, when uh, we'll be the, the last community, a, a large community on the earth that will be marking the uh, co commemorative events. Uh, the, the, the signs of uh, uh, reunification. We can see, uh, we can watch the footage that is uh, gradually arriving from, from various uh, parts of the world, from Middle East, 
from Armenia, from Russia, people and the representative of our, our, our nation, the, 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 the country, are united in their, in their message, in their pledge, especially today as, we, as the, hundreds, the, the centennial anniversary is, is, uh, is, is, is more visible. We pledge to ourselves and our constituency to, bring, to come with more tangible results uh, uh, in, in five years from now, the year 2015. So thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, uh, I, I would like to convey the uh, appreciation uh, on behalf of my government to the City Council for organizing this event, which is, by the way, the only uh, uh, worldwide city-organized and sponsored event uh, uh, on Armenian genocide. Thank you very much. I would like to invite to the podium from the governor of the state of California office, Lisa Kalustian. It is honor, an honor to be here with you once again, representing a governor who has been a tremendous supporter and friend of the Armenian community. And as he has done every year since he was elected governor, Governor Schwarzenegger has issued a proclamation. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. There are just two or three sentences that I want to share with you. The Armenian Genocide was a terrible breach of human rights and an event that has outraged the world. As Americans and Californians, it is our duty to raise awareness of the Armenian Genocide and to participate in the remembrance and mourning of the loss of innocent lives. Therefore, I, Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of the state of California, do hereby proclaim April 19th through the 26th, 2010, as days of remembrance of the Armenian Genocide. Thank you. I'd like to call State Senator Carol Liu, please. Good evening. It's my honor to join you this evening, remembering the Armenian Genocide tonight as remembering the fall of Armenia, fallen of Armenia. And by remembering them, we dedicate ourselves to stop innocents from being persecuted anywhere in the world. We collectively commit ourselves to making sure that such brutal and shameful atrocities are prevented from ever occurring again. That is why Senator Joe Semidian and I introduced Senate Joint Resolution 26, designating April 24th as the California Day of Remembrance for the Armenian Genocide. But seeing you here tonight, I cannot help but feel inspired. No doubt, the loss suffered 95 years ago is worthy of strong condemnation. When I look out at this audience, I don't see a community marred by tragedy. I see a beautiful and vibrant community of hardworking families dedicated to the future of their children and the well-being of the community. The Armenians came here in the diaspora were not content to merely accept their fate and survive. Instead, they build churches, businesses, communities, and dedicate themselves to thrive. The tragic genocides that marred much of the 20th century are deplorable. Only through remembering, only through understanding, can we hope to avoid the mistakes of the past. I am proud to represent one of the largest Armenian communities in America, I'm proud because of the many amazing contributions you and your children have made to the arts, education, government, and business. And I know that you will continue to better our community. Thank you very much for allowing me to share this occasion with you. God bless.
Thank you, Senator Liu and the other uh, speakers. We have a thoughtful, artistic program this evening. I'm sure you're going to uh, feel the same way that uh, Mayor Najarian and I feel. The committee worked very hard, and so it's our pleasure to present it to you. Please welcome performance actors of the Armenian Dramatic Arts Alliance performing March. What did you see? What do you remember? What are your earliest memories? Nothing. What did you see? And what do you remember? And what is your earliest memory? Nothing. Nothing really. What did you see? What do you remember? What is your earliest memory? I'm an orphan. I can't even remember the year I was born. The silence has become so thick. You must not feel silent. What did you see? What do you remember, and what? What were your earliest memories? Nothing. Are you sure? I said nothing. Nothing at all? Nothing at all. Any early memories? There must be something. Why? Why do you want me to remember? Oh, so others don't forget. But who are you to force us to remember? Who are you to do this to us? I, I'm your conscience. And I'm the one thing that will make you remember. 1908, we had a basket that the hens and chickens would go under. I remember thinking, I'll hide under there like the chicks do in case they come to kill us. I was three years old. What did you see? What do you remember? And what were your earliest memories? When I came to the United States to make it official, I had to guess a birthday, so I guessed November 4th because they always said there was snow on the ground when I was born. In 1895, the Turks started war with the Kurds and our citizens. They caught a young boy. He must have been trying to run with the Fedayees, the guerrilla fighters, and he got caught. He couldn't have been more than 18 years of age. He was from Madash. They took him to a beautiful field where they have picnics a playground for kids. The police and the gendarmes wanted to know who he was. They wanted to talk to him. They wanted to ask him questions. They wanted to know who he was, where he came from, and who he belonged to, but he wouldn't say anything, so they tortured him. Their guns had bayonets on them, and he stuck them into his body and tortured him so that he would talk. The village people surrounded the entire scene, the village people began to raise hell. They began to scream and yell this and that and wonder what was going on. But they couldn't do a thing 
They watched this poor young kid be tortured because if he had said anything, they would have all been killed and he died eight hours later. I remember the massacre in Marash. <gasps> there was a well-educated Armenian lawyer who had a lot of Turkish friends who told him, we're coming to slaughter the Armenians in Aintab. They're sending four gendarmes for every family. Three will go inside and kill whoever lives there. And the fourth one will stay outside in case anyone is trying to escape. You better prepare to protect yourselves. When the English army leaves Aintab, the killing will begin. We have to build trenches, trenches on every street corner. There should be one on one side and one on the other side. Trenches built with guns. So when the mob comes in, we'll shoot them. On a Saturday afternoon, at 12 o'clock, they came in the thousands. They raided our house. We went into hiding. My father started throwing furniture from the balcony, whatever there was, just to stop them from coming in. They went inside and they killed a young man, like a lamb with a knife, cut his leg off, and then his neck. They went into the basement and killed another man. They hit my brother with a sword and cut him and wounded my mother. You could only see my brother's eyes. His face was full of blood. They left them there like that until he died. They killed seven people in our house. I wish every day I didn't remember. When we ran away, my mother hid us in barrels. We would hide all day until things got quiet. So when night came, she took us out and fed us. I, I don't remember how long that went on for. When the gendarmes finally caught us, I was shaking in my boots. <laughs> I was clinging to my mother. Uh, I, they took me outside to cut my neck. Then they wanted to cut off my hand, but they clubbed me unconscious instead. My mother pushed a card and shouted, What do you want with the child? So... They let me go because if you're under 10, you're free. And that's the last thing I remember. Do you still want us to remember? Otherwise, you have a present without a past. As time passes, memory fades, dreamlike glimpses, frozen landscapes, flashbulb memories, fleeting memories. Memory fades. It dies and withers. Like the willow tree waiting for its lover. But since it's inside of you, each and every one of you is inside of you, the memories of your ancestors. It has permeated your soul, your skin, your body, your memories, your spirit. Propositional memories. Suppressed memories. Selective memories. Habit memories. Procedural memories. Kinesthetic memories. Idiosyncratic memories. Selective memories. Collective memories. Recollective memories. Episodic memories. Childhood memories. What could I remember? I was only five. Hiding in a village away from a city. Playing in a garden. My mother watched from the rooftop as the caravan of people marched in front of her. She watched as a woman parted from the caravan and snuck behind our house with her two children. She was pregnant. The caravan passed and my mother went down and took care of them. A few days later, a Turkish woman discovered this and called the gendarmes. They tried to take her children away from her, but she wouldn't let them, so they buried her alive. 
We watched from the rooftop crying. For two days, we heard this woman underground moaning for two long days. Remembering for the brain is a lot like doing. But forgetting will turn us into a blank page. It will make us invisible. It will make us disappear from history, and that's the way it already is. The act of remembering, the act of summoning spontaneous memory, re-traumatizes a person. The brain recreates it. The same neurons that fire most furiously when the act first occurred will fire again. But we must use the past to fuel our present. The rich catalog of vignettes together form our collective past. Memory and willpower is what every culture must have. Memory is a palace, ancient philosophers say, that every room parks a thought. We need mechanisms so that we can select every memory that we want and allow those memories to win over competing thoughts. A healed memory is not a deleted memory. Memory is a source of knowledge, even if the past is inappropriate. God gave us memory so that we could have roses in December. Each self must remember for itself. What did you see? What do you remember? Do you have any early memories? Please welcome the Glendale Philharmonic, led by artistic director and principal conductor, Mikhail Avatisian.
Please welcome Ruben Arutunya. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Robert A. Papazian, an Emmy Award winner for his critically acclaimed production of Inherit the Wind on NBC, is recognized as one of, as one of television's most successful and creative producers. 
In 1988, Papazian partnered with writer-producer James Hirsch to create one of the industry's most respected independent production companies, Papazian Hirsch Entertainment. Papazian's body of work includes producing more than 80 television movies, as well as miniseries and TV series, which have garnered a total of 27 Emmy nominations and nine Emmys in various categories. The partners co-founded Ray Art Studios in 1997. They sold the studio in 2005, and Robert became CEO and partner of Sunset Gower Studios. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife Sandy and four sons. And a note of interest, Mr. Papazian's great uncle is the Armenian hero Shahan Natali. Mr. Papazian. Thank you for that wonderful introduction at a most solemn occasion. Mayor Nigerian, Councilman Quintero, and dignitaries, thank you for allowing and supporting this annual commemorative celebration of the 95th Remembrance of the Armenian Genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be here with you tonight, but honestly speaking, I have no idea why I was chosen to be the keynote speaker. I'm second-generation Armenian, married for 40 years to a beautiful Irish Catholic lady, Odar, raised in Southern California on a surfboard, surrounded by bikinis, dancing to the likes of the Beatles, Johnny Mathis, and the Beach Boys. I clearly remember, however, when I was in kindergarten and the teacher asked everyone to stand up and introduce themselves. When it came to my turn, I proudly said, my name is Robert Papazian, to which she exclaimed, what's that? I looked at myself thinking I had four arms, perhaps six feet, or maybe a carrot growing out of the top of my head. When she realized I was a bit confused, she said, your nationality, what is your nationality? Quietly, I said, I'm Armenian. I suddenly heard the girl next to me squeal, Ick! What's that in Ick? Was I going through my life with what's that in Ick? No way. I could become Italian. Everybody knew what Italian was. Perhaps change my name to Smith or Jones. I asked myself, did I look like a Smith and Jones with dark eyes and dark hair? I don't think so. I had a major problem. Not telling my parents for fear they would lecture me, and I wasn't a very good listener at that age. Who could I tell then that I, want, I didn't want to be known as Ick? My great uncle. He lived down the street, that's who. He'll know if I should be a Smith or Jones. I couldn't wait to tell him of my trials and tribulations. I ran down the street into his house and approached him at his desk. He immediately recognized that I had some important issues to discuss. As I began to talk, he took off his glasses, leaned down with his piercing eyes, and listened very carefully. When I was finished, he asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. I told him all I wanted to be is a bum, a tramp, just a bum. Now you think his next comment is going to be profound, don't you? Well, he said, Young Robbie, as he called me, to be a Smith or Jones bum is not good, but to be a Papazian bum, that's the best. <laughs> now that's being somebody. Mind you, he said this in Armenian, which I understood, patted me on the top of the head, and said, Now you go home and never let this bother you again. For fear, for years to come, whenever we were together, he referred to me as a bum, no matter how successful I was at the time, whether in school or working. After parting my way through college, in 1966, I was asked to serve in the armed forces. No, that's politically correct. I was drafted, taken from the surf and sand of Southern California 
and thrown into a collection of kids from all over the United States to fight in a war that we really didn't understand. But this is America, and for the privilege of living here, this was our duty. <clears throat> Weeks into basic training, a huge sergeant approached me because I was being somewhat of a smart aleck to a lower-ranked drill instructor. He yelled, Private Papazon, now give me 50, meaning push-ups. I looked, up at him, looked at him squarely in the eyes and said, it's Papazian, Sergeant, not Papazon. <laughs> he didn't give me an inch. And then he yelled, what's that? There it was again, what's that and a possible ick approaching. I quickly said, Armenian, Sergeant, I'm Armenian. It was a long pause before an ever so slight grin cracked his face and he said, Papazian, Armenian. I know some Armenians. They're really great people. Then another long pause before he said, Now Papazan, give me 50. <laughs> Laughter is a great emotion. It takes the pressure off of everyday life and puts it back into perspective. In 1968, I was honorably discharged from the armed services and was extremely fortunate in launching my career into the rather new world of television. Prior to being drafted, I had been working at CBS Network starting in 1961 as a page. The biz business was young and vibrant, and programs such as I Love Lucy and Ed Sullivan and Danny Thomas and The Dick Van Dyke Show the list goes on. I was so fortunate to work on these programs and learn, and learn firsthand what show business was all about. I knew, always knew I wanted to be a storyteller, and what better way to create and communicate thoughts and ideas and reach millions of people all at the same time? Television. I knew that becoming a producer was the most important thing for me to accomplish. So as I look back some 40 years later, in all humility, I can say with some certainty, I accomplished what I wanted. I would like to talk about a famous Armenian man by the name of Hagopder Hagopian. He was born in Armenia, orphaned at the age of 11. Hagop was extremely inquisitive and intelligent and was sent to Istanbul and studied at the famed Barbarian Academy, where his literary career and community activisms were launched. At the age of 16, he returned to his native village to teach school. Four years later, in 1904, four, he immigrated to the United States. Spared from the atrocities of the 1915, he returned to Armenia to fulfill his boyhood vow to devote his entire life to defending the rights of his people worldwide. Over a period of more than six decades, he wrote under the non diplom Shahan Natali and published numerous Armenian newspapers and books while traveling to Armenian communities throughout the world. Shahan Natali's literary legacy embodies his love, devotion, and pride in the American culture, language, and literature. He transmitted these feelings to his family and others who touched who he touched. Well, he did. He touched the top of my head. Remember what he said? Be a Papazian, bum. That's the best. Now, that's being somebody. If you want to read more about my great uncle Shahan, go to the Los Angeles Public Library Armenian Language and Literature Collection. The Armenian Genocide is a time in history that we should never forget because no innocent life should have been taken for absolutely no reason. Historians can argue the questions of how and why for centuries to come, but the cold hard fact is, from 1915 to 1923, by order of the Turkish government, one and a half million Armenians died from the atrocities. We all know about the heroes of Musada fighting with a few hundred rifles putting up a fierce resistance against attacks by the Tur Turkish army for some 53 days. 
They saved thousands of men and women and children who were then transported to refugee camps until the end of World War I. <clears throat> I quote, My decision to attack Poland was arrived at last spring. I feared that the political constellation would compel me to strike simultaneously at England, Russia, France, and Poland. Our strength consists in our speed and our brutality. Genghis Khan led ma many millions of women and children to slaughter. I have issued the command to send to death without compassion men, women, and children of Polish descent and language. Only then will we gain the living space that we need. After all, who speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? End quote. Adolf Hitler speaking to his generals, August 22, 1939. Read my lips, you miserable swine. You were wrong. We are a strong nation that survived and flourished. People around the world have never forgotten. The genocide is taught in schools and universities. In fact, my grandson, who attends one of the highest-ranked academic high schools in Los Angeles, recently did a report on the genocide for his history class. Today, we are more productive than ever before. Armenians are active in every aspect of modern civilization. The 21st century brings opportunities that have never been more available, and we have capitalized on them. We have met the challenge and conquered. The Armenian community has made innumerable social contributions to the United States of America, our new and exciting home. We are so fortunate to live in a country that allows every nationality the freedom to choose and to govern their life to its fullest capacity. With our limitless intellectual energy, we came to America nearly 150 years ago and carved an enormous footprint that has etched its signature in every aspect of modern American culture. Many of the genocide survivors came to the United States, forged a life, rooted their families, taught the lessons of the past, and spoke happily of the future. Look at what we have accomplished in the past 95 years. Achievements second nature, whether in arts, science, business, academia, Armenians are known as leaders, contributors, and innovators. We are mayors and governors, statesmen and doctors and dentists, real estate agents and farmers and grocers, lawyers, judges, writers, directors, actors, singers, musicians. The list is way too long. In every walk of life, Armenians are there. My father was an entrepreneur. When he passed, my mother, then 54, became a manicurist, my brother a home designer and builder, my father's cousin a world-renowned physicist, another cousin a lawyer, and another a teacher. A few years ago, after completing a movie for television that my partner and I produced, we had the proverbial cast and crew party. As I was standing next to a very famous actress, she turned to her equally famous husband, and I overheard her say, when she was whispering, at the end of the day, we all go home, and we are who we are, and they are who they are. At first I thought, what an elitist comment. But then I thought about it, and perhaps she was right. Perhaps, at the end of the day, after putting your very best effort and honest, hard day's work, whether in school, office, or at home, your hard work pays off, and you become who you are. As Armenian Americans, let us never forget our origin, nor relinquish the responsibility of respect for one another, regardless of nationality. It is up to us to, pr to protect and serve the next generation. What's that in ick? has been replaced with, I love your music, I love your church, 
I love being your neighbor when I'm sick because I know you'll be there when I need somebody. I love your food and laughter and the way you think. I love being your best friend. God gave us two hands, one to hold on to the past, the other much stronger, to grasp and hold on to the future and beyond. Thank you. Please welcome back actors of the Armenian Dramatic Arts Alliance performing Deportation. The Surgun, we used to call it in Turkish. Surgun. That's when a deportation started. Now, the reason they gave us, I was too young to understand. It was a terrifying thing. When my father used to come home and say that so-and-so had been deported, it was a lottery. A name was picked and a family was leaving. And the next day, two or three other people we knew was a tragedy, crying and anguish. I don't know what promises were given for deportation, but these people knew they were leaving not to be brought back. It was just a way of getting rid of them. That's all it was. Oh, so many troubles. One day. So many troubles. Then one day the time came for my uncle Krikor to go. That was a terrible time for us. Even we weren't very close. We were all just there crying together. It was like sheep being brought to the slaughter. You were just waiting for your turn. That's all it was. You know, it's a weird thing. When someone comes to your house and tells you, tomorrow you have to leave. There were no papers, nothing. There was just an order throughout the city that all Armenians were going. They didn't give us a reason. It's just that they didn't want us in their country. So the policeman came to your house and said that you had to leave at a certain time. And that's what I remember. Oh, so many troubles, I don't even want to talk about it. It's good to talk about it, to embrace those collective memories of the past. It was nighttime when they took us. It must have been the summertime because I remember not having many clothes on. By this time, my father wasn't there, and neither were my uncles. My grandmother, my mother's mother, her two youngest daughters, her son, my uncle, Sammy, and his wife. So whoever was left got together outside of town and gathered all of our belongings. There was so much pushing and shoving going on. And if you stayed, they didn't leave you alone. They would go in and vandalize the whole house Take whatever they could. They used to say, a push, a push. Tragedy was all around us in the city, crying and weeping. This is what I saw with my own eyes. I mean, when it's a tragedy, our memories is one of the most important things we have to remember our history. When these soldiers came and they took those people, there were women and children and sick people and everyone had to march. And we saw the march going by in the main drag every day from our bedroom windows. Rebus! Oh, Here's the thing, we were not deported, and I couldn't understand why at the time. Later I understood that the Vali of Maharaj had promised my father to take his brother's share of the business. He would let my father stay and run the business for him. He personally guaranteed that my father and his family would not be deported. So anything to survive, you know. So my father agreed. I was told that the Turks wanted to annihilate the Armenians. But the Armenians were tradespeople that they couldn't do without. 
They just didn't have the skills. So they needed to keep some people behind to keep the economy going. It's not that they loved us anymore. They just wanted to keep the economy going, you know? So the people that were left behind were there for their own use. They needed people to make pots and pans and medicines. And my father was there to run the business for the Vali or the mayor or whatever you want to call him. I can't remember really. In everyday life, memories compete with one another, you know? We'd wake up in the morning and see droves of people with what animals they had or whatever belongings they could take. And they weren't the kindest towards their animals either. I mean, like I said before, the Vali was my father's partner. And so my father tried to save his brother. But the Vali warned my father, if this continues, you'll be going yourself. I'm having enough trouble keeping you here as it is. So my father had to keep quiet. Otherwise, we would have the same fate as the others. I remember this very distinctly. By this time, I don't know exactly how many Armenians were left behind. We were very young. There were some older people who remember more vividly. But pretty soon, all Armenians were gone. There were some written reports. Figures got thrown around, like 30,000. That's how many Armenians were at Marash at one point. Like I said, I was too young to understand. All this took a year or so. I just know there were at least 10,000 Armenians massacred there. What else do you remember? I remember the Armenian Protestant churches and the Apostolic churches. Yes, but the churches all closed when the deportation started. I remember the German orphanage I was sent to. What was the name of it? I don't know. There weren't any names on the street. You just knew where you were by which church you were near. Surp Hagop, or down on the other end, Surp Garapetah. Then in the summer of 1918, the war ended. Germany lost, and the German missionaries were deported. The Americans stepped in and took over our school. And that summer, we realized what it was to be Armenian again, even if we didn't feel that way anymore. There's something to that. We were very attached to our school. We were more Armenian than, we were more German than Armenian by then. We were practically told not to speak or even think in Armenian. Every morning we would salute the German flag. We would sing to their presence picture. Then by January 1919, we went home. And home by then was whatever you made of it. And if you don't know what home is, it's where your family is. It's where your parents are. That's where home is. The thing we must not forget is that some Turkish people helped us. Yes. And that is how I was saved. What I remember is, I was three years old, maybe three or four. It was like a dream. We were carried by a big Turkish man me and my sister, one under each arm, to a home in hiding. <laughs> I remember the horrible fear and the darkness in a house that was so strange to us. That is how we were saved. That is how I am here. We were in hiding for eight months. No lights, no, no lights, no food. Just dried cereal and potatoes. 
We didn't even wear shoes because we were afraid to make noise. We had pressed cheese and dried fruits, dates, raisins, apricots. Finally, we were out of hiding, and they took us, my sister and I, to an orphanage in Marash, run by German Protestants. It was called Bethel Orphanage. There were 200 Armenian girls. <laughs> my earliest memories were of Ms. Runner, then Helen Stockman, and other teachers, <laughs> like Sister Mary. <laughs> I was five years old when I got there. <laughs> they gave us older girls to take care of us, and then when we became teenagers, we took care of the younger ones. No, there was no motherly affection, there was no love. But we didn't know we were missing it, so it didn't bother us. When the war started in Marash, there was fighting everywhere. Fires everywhere. The Turks were throwing fire at our school. Some of the soldiers tried to protect it by putting wet carpets around the wooden doors. We heard a rumor that the people from Marash were all leaving, the French, the Germans, everyone. The Armenian teachers decided to leave too. They didn't care what happened to the orphans. There were 200 of us. We didn't know what to do. The house mother said, if you want to leave with us, bring some food. So 51 of us decided to leave. We each took some food and a blanket and followed the people from Marash. We were afraid the Turks were following us. We had heard what happened to the Armenian girls who were left behind. The night before we left, it began to snow. Snow was everywhere. Huh. When we walked, our feet became frozen. Eventually, we ended up walking barefoot. One night, we slept under the snow. We had one blanket, 15 of us squeezed under it. We were told, don't go to sleep, you'll freeze. So we didn't. The next morning, I got up and started walking. But some of the girls didn't get out of the snow, and they froze right there. One night as I was walking, I saw the house mother and the cook. Seeing that I was half frozen, they encouraged me to walk and helped me. Four days and five nights later, I arrived at a location. I heard voices. You know, it's funny how you hear voices, huh? Hmm. I followed the voices to a river where there was a husband and a wife and four children and a three-day-old baby. They had found a cow killed it, and were making kebab by the fire. That was really something. My feet were too frozen to put by the fire. I will never forget that. The next morning, the man made sandals for all of us from cow skin. I walked in those sandals all the way to Izelia. We saw French Algerian soldiers, their bodies lying in the road. People took their clothes. The French soldiers came and put the bodies in the snow. We watched all of this with no feeling. Some of the girls became snowblind. Finally, we reached Izelia, and the girls came together. There were five of us left. Some of the gendarmes gave us bread. Somewhere, I had heard that my brother was still alive in the Turkish army in Adana. So I suddenly became brave and I said, girls, let's ride to Adana. So we walked to the station to get a train, looking very white and sick. I was wearing three dresses, my stockings were torn, I had no shoes, but I had the sandals from the cowskin, which were still good. 
there was a young man there who took off his coat, put it in the mud, and said, sit here, girls. Then he went and came back and brought us big loaves of white bread. We didn't know who he was, but he was a godsend. When the train arrived, he made everybody wait and put us on first. Soon enough, I learned it was Jim Carnelian, who had heard about the trains going to Adana and wanted to help the Armenians. He was from the United States. His mother was Armenian? No. His mother was American. His father was Armenian. A little bit my memory not so good. Hmm. I will never forget what he did for us that day. At the train station in Adana, relatives, people would come every day looking for their relatives. The guards wouldn't let us go. One day a man came and said he knew where our teachers were at the Armenian Congregational Church. I asked the girls if they wanted to go, but they were too frozen. So I went by myself. I waited until the guards weren't looking, and I snuck out and ran down the main street to the Armenian Congregational Church. They had emptied the church and were keeping the refugees there. I saw many girls from our school. Huh. I don't know how many of the original 51 ever made it. One of the girls who was working there came to me and hugged me and kissed me and had crying tears of joy. I didn't remember her. She said, I know where your brother is. So she took me to a house, which was the Armenian Red Cross Hospital. There they bandaged me up and gave me medicine and kept me there. She said, come back in one week to my house. And when I went there, and when I went there, there stood my brother, Aman. <laughs> Please welcome back the Glendale Philharmonic Orchestra, Mikhail Avetisian, and welcome soprano Narine Ojakian.
Please welcome back actors of the Armenian Dramatic Arts Alliance performing a life in a new world. When I first came to this country, there was this man, Yakub. Yakub was a tailor. He had a shop in New York, and he really helped me out. That's, why don't you come down? If you like, that is, just help me out. See if you like it. Well, I was working at Aram's place then, but I didn't like it. It was too dirty, you know? Like this, three, three stitches here. Yakub yeah. showed me how to do the pressing. Okay, and here, and here. And a little sewing. A little bit Buttons, here. hems, things like that. For the cuffs. I used to watch him, see how he does it. Uh, soon, I started with alterations, and then I moved up. I used to see how he pins up the fabric, uh, makes the patterns. And soon, I was uh, putting linings in the jackets. It used to take me about three hours to put one lining in a jacket. Uh, I made the cuffs and everything. And then, a few months later, Yakub says to me, All right, I don't want you to come here. You're wasting your time. Why don't you have your own business? Well, I wanted to, of course. I mean, because I used to run my father's business uh, when I was in Aintah. So, I opened up a store in Brooklyn, by the East River, near the wharf, you know, where the boats come in. I think this is a good place. East side, by the river. Good. It's not too Italian. Ah, you can handle. I've seen how you handle the customers. So I was 20 years old now, in one of the toughest Italian neighborhoods. You know Al Capone? His club. Al Capone's club was one block from my store. Can you believe that? His gang used to come into my store. I would fit them up with the most stylish suits I had. They were very particular, especially about the cuffs. 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 Three Italian tailors moved into the same neighborhood. They couldn't stay here. But you should have seen the business coming into my store. There was a barbershop next door. They had three chairs. They got busy, too. Business was booming. The neighbors would look to me. They said, where are all these people come from? I was working till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Uh, Yakub used to come help me out, close the store. I would call him and say, Yakub, I, I got too many customers. They used to come in, help me out here and there after hours. So I stayed here about... Uh, about a year. And then you know what happened? This one customer, he has a daughter, Italian. And this daughter, she likes to come in and stay with me until I close. And I said to her, um, this is not right. But I like it here, and I like you. I think it's better you not come and stay this late. Uh, you're too young. I am 17, but I am old for my age. You are Italian. I'm Armenian, uh, and I'm 20. 
No problem. I'm going to be uh, closing up the shop from now on alone. Sarkis, you're working too late. Go home early. She uh, married to a doctor soon afterwards. Whew. It was good for me. But then, then there was a Greek girl. She comes after me. She was uh, very pretty, very pretty, you know? And she wants to marry me, and I told her, you know, I can't marry. I can't marry you. Uh, my business, it's new, and uh, it doesn't pay me to take care of my parents and take care of you at the same time. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do it. And, and she said to me, You don't have to take care of me. I will go to work. It's a lot of things, you know? When you're in a big city, so many things can happen. So, I decided that the only way to get rid of her would be to sell the store and move to a different neighborhood. I was scared. If anything should happen to her by somebody else, she gets in trouble, they might blame me for it. And if anything happens, I wouldn't be able to take care of my parents. And they always came first, you know? So, we moved to another part of Brooklyn which was good at the time. This is good. Nordstrom. This is good, not bad. There was this uh, big apartment building there with about 200 families inside. And every time I would go upstairs, I would come back downstairs with a load of work. I didn't need much more. We stayed there and then I opened up two more stores. I like the way you think. Expansion is good. Both neighborhoods good. Abbott Field, Washington Street, it's good. Then I was living with my sister, but soon my mother came, and then we got our own apartment. And then a couple of years later, I think I met the one, an Armenian girl, Ani Kakorian, good family from Aintab. Uh, they live in Connecticut, and their daughter is very, very nice looking. So, we go to Connecticut with my mother. But my mother says that she doesn't like her very much. She says she's stuck up. So I must leave her. Finally, in 1935, I go back to Beirut. It's the Depression now, but I'm putting money in the bank. My mother, she decides to fix me up with a wife. Her sister's daughter's daughter, my cousin, Virgin. I've never even seen her before. But they send the ring and we're engaged, the Armenian way. So I go to Lebanon to see her. You're gonna find it difficult. Having dated every girl in the United States, get fixed up now in Beirut. They've got a lot of Armenian girls in this country. Yeah, but she's my cousin's daughter, yes. my mother's sister's daughter's daughter. So I go there. But I don't want to get married because, you know, I don't care for her very much. She's living in Aleppo, and they, they all come all the way to Beirut. She doesn't appeal to me very much. Uh, so I tell my mother, you know? And my mother says, you know, it's this big shameful thing, right? You come all the way here from the United States, and uh, everybody's talking about it, and now, you know, you don't like the girl. How can I marry someone that I don't like? I didn't like my wife, too. <laughs> I got married, now I like her. I think about this. I think about my mother. And I don't want to hurt her because she's been so good to us. I feel pressured. The Armenians, they are pressured. Their parents, their brothers, their sisters. And I'm finished. Virgin? You take this man to be your husband? Sarkis Brusalian? 
you take this nice Armenian girl, Virgin, to be your wife? And that was that. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to the final part of our program, it's very important that we recognize and thank our sponsors who made this event possible. The Armenian Council of America, the Armenian Rights Council, the Armenian National Committee Glendale Chapter, Glendale Arts, Alco Printing, Positive Motions, and our annual Commemoration Event Committee, my colleague Frank Quintero, the community members, Ara Aharonian, Ellen Asaturian, Bianca Bagaturian, Ruslan Biryakov, Lina Bozoyan, Peter Darakjan, Arlet Derhovanesian, Jiro Habeshian, Viken Khachaturian, Barry McComb, Nora Yakubian, and our city staff, Vicki Gardner, Dean Lopez, Rich Wells, and of course, Zizette Mullins. Also to St. Mary's Apostolic Church and the First Baptist Church of Glendale. All of the performers, our keynote speaker, Mr. Papazian, and those who provided us publicity and media help, Aspares, Horizon TV, Masis Weekly, GTV6, and the graphics department. The Armenian Genocide is a sad page in history. The few survivors that are left are hoping, hoping that one day there will be justice. I'm here to tell you, yes, there is hope. More biographies of the survivors are written and published now than ever before. Schools around the world are teaching the First World War and including the Armenian Genocide. Several liberal-minded Turkish historians are studying the archives in Europe and substantiating the fact that, yes, there was a genocide committed by the Turks, and they speak loudly and they write about it. Today's Armenian youth is better educated and determined in the pursuit of justice, more now than in any of the generations before. This weekend, they're holding memorial marches in Hollywood and every April 24th, and over 40,000 young and old attend. Tens of thousands will attend the memorial in Montebello. Thousands will be marching in front of the Turkish embassy in L.A. And let me give you the very latest news report. This is very important. We've just heard from Turkey that Turkish intellectuals and scholars in Istanbul are inviting the public to hold a Remembrance Day and candlelight vigil in memory of the Armenian victims of 1915 at Taksim Square in Istanbul. Why all this when the Turkish government openly denies the genocide? Well, perhaps the intellectuals want to show the world that they are a democratic nation and are ready to examine their Ottoman past. And perhaps, maybe now, finally, they're ready to educate their own people and accept the truth. The words of my grandfather ring in my ears continually. Aiskan Charik, Te Moranan Mervortik, Tolvoks Ashkara Garta Hayun Nahadink. No, grandfather, we will not forget, and we will not rest until justice is done. Ladies and gentlemen, performing next are two young, gifted artists who will play traditional Armenian instruments. One following in the footsteps of his grandfather, and one blazing a trail for Armenian oud players. Please welcome Jivan Gasparian II 
and Anthony Kiviri.
Thank you.